Support for your fantastic mind, provided by Southern Company Foundation. Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind, I'm Jay Watson. They are the foundation of our lives, our memories. From moments in our childhood with our parents or grandparents, to the births of our children, to the countless mundane, wonderful, and inevitably terrible moments in our lives, our memories of our life's experiences shape who we are. But memories are a terrible casualty for the six million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. So this week, we're going to share with you the results of decades of research that has proven what we can do to preserve our cognitive function as we get older. We're gonna show you how you can be part of team science in the fight against this disease and where you or anyone you know can get a screening no matter where you live in the state of Georgia. We'll also show you how flickering lights can be a key part of preventing or delaying this disease. And we have a love story that you won't soon forget. But we begin this week in Chicago, where Emory scientists are part of a team learning from nuns and priests how to age well and keep our memories intact. On this day, there is little in the way of wind in the Windy City. Instead, it's sunshine overload at Buckingham Fountain in Chicago's Grant Park. Known for its deep dish pizza and its brutal winters, what's lesser known is that Chicago is the epicenter of a study that is unlike any other in the world. 30 minutes from downtown Chicago is Sacred Heart Monastery in Lyle, Illinois. Home to 22 Benedictine sisters, nuns. Theirs is a life of prayer, community, service, and chores. Okay, now follow me. Okay, coming. My name is Sister D. Paul Stava. I'm 88 years old. And I'm the third oldest in this community. While Sister DePaul delivers the mail, 83-year-old sister Lois Jean helps get ready for lunch. I ran nun for 66 years. Along with morning prayer and mass and volunteer work, all done together in community, these sisters and some nearby priests have another title as well research participant. I always felt like I wanted to do something uh, to uh, help people. And um, when they said that this was uh, uh, a research program, and I, I know my dad um, had Alzheimer's, I think. We didn't call it that at that time. But um, I always felt so bad because he was like a different person when, when this happened to him. Eighty-seven-year-old sister Christine Kuba is one of 1,500 nuns and priests across the country who have been research participants in the religious order study from Rush University in Chicago. I feel um, that it's a contribution to help people out that um, have the disease. I I feel very bad about that disease. I think it takes away your humanness. Emory University is a collaborator in the landmark 25-year-long study. The amount of information that can be collected now in days is what we used to collect over a decade. <laughs> 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, actually, let's go, let's go to the other one. It's not going to be figured out in one person's lab. It's going to be a team. Um, somebody will look to see if the person had Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. David Bennett is the director of Russia's Alzheimer's Disease Center and leads the religious order study, which began when he was inspired by an earlier study done on older nuns. 
Participants in the religious order study begin taking part at 65 years old and includes nuns and priests. We love the idea of working with the nuns, priests, and brothers. They live communally. They're have spent their lives, you know, um, committed to the benefit of other people. And here we could offer them the opportunity to continue that giving after they're dead. As a wise person once said, growing old isn't for sissies. My name is Sister Josephine Callis, and I am 93 years old. 95. What? <laughs> 95, that's right, thank you. You were just gonna stand here? I'm going to press a button on a remote. So I'm gonna have you do that one one more time. Every year, researchers come to Sacred Heart to test the nuns, running them through a battery of cognitive and neurological tests. I want you to tell me all the animals you can think of in one minute. Ready? Begin. Horse, mule, donkey, cow, lamb, sheep, goat, dog, cat, um, mouse, giraffe, camel, um, so now I want to see if you can identify different smells. Hmm, that's hard to tell. I, I think rose. The tests are not easy. It's always very interesting how much you can, uh, how you would say, decline from what you did last year. Uh, you, don't, you don't realize that until when you go through this program, how much you can forget. So now we're gonna do that same thing with your left hand. Across the street at St. Procopius Abbey, 85-year-old Father David Turner goes through the same testing each year. Okay, that'll be fine. When I saw a possibility of me contributing to research, that's why I signed up and, and have been part of this program. Now I'm going to name three objects. In this study, nuns account for just over 70% of research participants. So Priests make up 30%. I'm gonna go ahead Fewer than 10% are minorities. Okay. She's here because her chair is here, and she puts the dishes away. Come on. <laughs> there is something else all these nuns and priests agree to when they sign up. This little thing right here is critical for the way we encode memories. Brain donation after death. And how do you feel about that? I'm dead. What do I care? <laughs> yeah, you could have my brain. Sister DePaul loves to entertain. My nickname was Skinny when I entered because I was 98 pounds. Through humor <laughs> and her harmonica. <laughs> the research is showing that her positive outlook on life could help protect her from dementia. You're funny. <laughs> Thank you. When people die and we get the brain, okay, our, our responsibility to them and to the funders is to ensure that it has maximal uh, possibility of helping other people. And so to do that, we have to save the brain tissue in a variety of different ways uh, that make it useful for a variety of different studies. And for a study that started 25 years ago, um, to have the brain saved in a way that it can be useful for technologies far in the future. There's gray and white matter, right? And so you can see the different color. Emory Brain Health's Dr. Alan Levy and Dr. Bennett take us on a tour of the freezer farm at Rush, where the brains of the nuns and priests are stored and used for research. But this is like the hard drive where memories get formed. The synergy of all the minds and talents of people working together you know, give insights that we otherwise just wouldn't be able to make. The brains, stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius in freezers with backup generator systems, are scanned, preserved, and frozen. 
They are also examined for hemorrhages or tumors or signs of neurodegenerative diseases. You can move your arm. All of the data compiled from this research and the year-to-year -year exams of the nuns and priests has led to some fascinating conclusions about why some of us stay sharp until the end of life and why some of us begin declining in our 60s. Genetics play a role. Some people inherit genes associated with the disease. And most of these brains are filled with the plaques and tangles associated with Alzheimer's disease. But not all the people who have these brains developed Alzheimer's. See some of the blood and that is where research is proving that lifestyle factors can help compensate, delay, and prevent dementia. We have a structured prayer life. In addition to annual cognitive and neurological testing, the nuns and priests are also interviewed about their lives, their upbringing, education level, musical or foreign language abilities, traumatic experiences, social activities, and their personality. <laughs> the picture that has developed from all of this research shows several lifestyle factors are critically important. Let us pray. The more engaged people remain throughout their lives, the more protection they have against dementia. Being cognitively active, physically active, and socially active, people often ask me, oh, what cognitive activity should I do? And what I tell them is two things. One is do varied activities, do different things, um, and do things that you like, all right? Because you're more likely to do them. Spa, si, ba. Spa, si, ba. Knowing a second language can delay dementia by up to four years. Musical training, another type of language, is also protective. Purpose in life, so having a goal and intentionality that guides what you do, this is, this is kind of in the fabric of some people, and, um, and it seems to protect you from everything. You're less likely to die. Religious order participants have unending purpose. I have never met a retired nun. Um, I mean, if they retire from job one, they're doing job two, and if they retire from job two, they're doing job three, and they are working and active and busy until they can't. Having a social network, people you feel comfortable confiding in, also protects you from cognitive decline. Bennett and his team are also studying the MIND diet, which is heavy in leafy green vegetables and berries and nuts and fish. There's no doubt that people that adhere to this MIND diet appear to, um, but they have a lower rate of cognitive decline. There are also things you should avoid in order to protect your cognition. If you know people that you're going to have a negative interaction with, just avoid them, all right? Because having negative social interactions is, is associated with a faster rate of memory loss and a greater risk of Alzheimer's dementia. One study out of Sweden showed that frequent but unsatisfactory interactions with one's children increase the risk of dementia. Other risk factors for dementia people who get angry and stay angry, people who socially isolate themselves, and people who are lonely. Staying active is important. Researchers had 1,000 participants wear an actigraph, similar to a pedometer, on their wrist, as they did everything from exercising to playing cards to cooking. And they found that those in the bottom 10% who moved the least were more than twice as likely to later be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And don't be a homebody. Rush researchers tested the life space of 1,300 participants, seeing how often they left their bedroom, their house, their neighborhood. Four years of data showed those most confined to their homes were twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's. Stay active, stay connected in deep relationships, eat well. Learn a second language and take music lessons. Avoid negative relationships. Explore new places. Have a purpose in life. Answers like this come from teams of researchers working together on a global level. One of the things that's really, really important is bringing people together from different perspectives that have different knowledge bases and are keeping up with different aspects of evolving science and technologies because all of this really comes together. Emery does the proteomics in the study, measuring all the proteins in the brain. It's an important part of the research sequence that creates a deeper understanding of dementia. I do think that the prevention space is the place that we're going to make real progress, all right? 
um, and, and that's what we've seen in all other chronic diseases. After we stain them... We right now, Bennett and his team are growing stem cells from participants' skin with the goal of creating targeted drugs. We're finding genes and then proteins that are associated with a slower rate of decline, okay? To get that, if, to find out whether those genes or proteins are druggable, I need to grow those cells, target those genes and proteins to see if it alters a readout of resilience. And if you can find those, okay, then you can move the next step of figuring out what part of the protein, all right, and what you're actually targeting and then, and then, and then work towards actually creating a drug. There's a level, I think, of peacefulness, of, of prayerfulness, of um, appreciation of God in our lives that is contentment. Today, for instance, is the Feast of St. James, and my reflection is um, you have to be a servant to the other. They've made a profound commitment to science. Faith has led them to help others long after their lives on earth end. I feel that Jesus was the, the representative of God on earth here, and uh, he would have done it. I'm sure he would have done it. Fifty-nine-year-old Kathy Knapp will be at Emory Brain Health all day. So what I'm going to have you do Kathy is... and 1,200 other people have volunteered to give their time to be part of the Emory Healthy Brain Study. I'm thinking no one looks good from this angle. Relax your arm down. People come in for six or seven hours. Mm -hmm. um, they do uh, all kinds of cardiovascular stuff. They do all kinds of cognitive testing. They n donate blood. Um, they give up spinal fluid. They all have lumbar punctures. Uh, they subsequently have MRI scans now that are getting scheduled for everybody. Um, they collect microbiome or stool samples. So I'm going to read that same list. I was a little disappointed with the pencil test drawing part that I couldn't do that a little bit better. So once you take a deep breath in. Kathy said the lumbar puncture was no big deal. That was it was pretty comfortable. It was like taking a nap on my side, so it wasn't that bad. The goal is to enroll 3,000 people to help researchers figure out two critical things when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. Who's going to develop disease and when are they going to develop disease? If we want to catch the very initial phases of that, we have to catch people in their 50s and 60s. And, um, and we can, in fact, using current technology, um, detect and identify the presence of Alzheimer's pathology in perfectly healthy people as early as in their 50s. Dementing disorders begin decades before symptoms start. This is a powerful way to help scientists predict and one day prevent Alzheimer's disease. This time I want you to do hold this cup of water as you walk. Kathy has no family history of dementia. She signed up after her partner did. When they come out with new information on a study, don't you wonder about the people who did that study? Don't you wonder about who lined up and said, OK, it's all right with me if you do this to find out so that down the road you can find out that you know X drug actually works for this thing? Or we found that if you eat this way and exercise that you can put off I mean, how else do they get that information if not for people to say, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. All right, so we're going to start with two automatic... The answers are within us. And so I said, sure, because why not? If the brain study is not for you, your participation will help us... Emory's Healthy Aging Study is open to anyone over 18 who can answer questions online. It is a game-changing effort. Close to 30,000 people are in it so far. A massive group effort is required to conquer this disease. All right. Say hello. We met kind of on a blind date.
That blind date for Leanne and John Doherty was over 46 years ago. She would become a psychotherapist, and he would go on to be a leading neurologist in Knoxville, Tennessee. Passionate advocate for the diagnosis and treatment of those with dementia, as the head of Cole Neuroscience Center at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, Dr. John Doherty treated 30,000 patients over the years. Ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of the Lady Volunteers. Including iconic University of Tennessee women's basketball coach, Pat Summit. She was a wonderful, tough nut. I mean, she had her passion and uh, she, she lived it. John diagnosed Summit with Alzheimer's disease. I said, you know, I had something serious to tell you, to talk about, you know. I told her that I thought it was Alzheimer's disease. She said uh, she did too, that uh, she had a grandmother, I think it was, who had Alzheimer's disease. She said she's going to fight it, and she got all these books and pamphlets. I mean, she had a stack of books on her table about uh, uh, treatments for Alzheimer's disease and whatever. She was determined. But <clears throat> she had pretty aggressive Alzheimer's disease. I mean, it got worse rather quickly. Pat Summit is the winningest coach in college basketball history. Pat Summit died in 2016. The Pat Summit Clinic is a milestone. John, who was on the board of the Pat Summit Foundation, helped to found the Pat Summit Alzheimer's Clinic at UT Medical Center. My mentor, Dr. Plum in, Plum in New York, used to say the most important uh, dementia that we deal with now is, uh, is um, um, the most important dementia that we deal with now is, is what, is the, the frontal dementias? Uh, yeah, let's go on. Today, at 75 years old, Dr. John Doherty is more than a year into his diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, the second most common form of dementia that impacts one and a half million Americans. By comparison, Alzheimer's disease impacts five and a half million Americans. I don't know whether I didn't want to deal with it or whatever at first. Leanne and I, you know, we, we taught, I mean, she, she knew the experience. I mean, she witnessed it. I mean, I've learned living with a neurologist, you notice the gait. You notice the movements. Um, it would be rare that we would go out to dinner that he wouldn't knock over something. I had a number of spells of falling out of bed. And I never, you know, what is this? And Leanne said, you know, whoa, that was a real fall. One time I hit my, the back of my head on a uh, night table. John's son, Andrew, gave speeches with him around the world about the diagnosis and treatment of dementia. Now, he helps his dad navigate a conversation. And uh, I've had a very significant problem in, in terms of Lewy body disease. Of, um, of uh, I've, anxiety. Yeah, of anxiety. I, I tend to miss a few words as time goes on. But um, anxiety was a terrible problem for me. John is an astute clinician, you know, brilliant, wonderful person, and uh, had the insight to realize the types of symptoms he was having. Dr. Alan Levy, the chairman of neurology at Emory Brain Health, is Dr. Doherty's doctor. We can now t um, use special tests like PET scans or some blood tests or spinal fluid tests in Alzheimer's disease to determine if some of the pathology, the microscopic pathology is present. In Lewy body disease, we don't yet have those same tests. Lewy bodies are named for Dr. Friedrich Lewy, a German neurologist who in 1912 discovered abnormal protein deposits that disrupt the brain's normal functioning in people with Parkinson's disease. These protein deposits develop in nerve cells in the brain regions involved in thinking, memory, and movement. Lewy body and Parkinson's have many similarities. There are often some um, signs that resemble Parkinson's disease that are overlapped with Parkinson's disease and the motor uh, features of Parkinson's disease. So for example, problems with gait and falls are very common in Lewy body disease as well. Sleep abnormalities are, we're learning, really one of the tip-offs. Up to 80% of people have hallucinations with Lewy body. 
memory loss tends to be more common in early Alzheimer's than in early Lewy body dementia. Lewy body cannot be definitely diagnosed until autopsy. When it comes to his own condition, Dr. Doherty's expertise has not dimmed. There's a long period in which you're symptomatic, falling out of bed, doing different things, and memory is still surprisingly good. That's because in, in Lewy body, you don't have that focal uh, abnormality of the hippocampus that's responsible for memory like you do in Alzheimer's disease. In normal Alzheimer's disease, hippocampus is involved and uh, the up other parts of the brain are not so involved. And in diffuse Lewy body disease, the pathology involves the frontal cortex, the autonomic system, the brain stem. So you get a lot of these um, uh, behavioral problems associated with it like um, agitation, depression. Specifics about what may have led the Oscar Lewy body has been in the news more in recent years because of prominent people diagnosed. Said Williams had Parkinson's disease, but a pathology report reveals he also suffered from Lewy body dementia. An autopsy showed beloved comedian Robin Williams, who committed suicide in 2014, had Lewy body. He launched CNN in 1980. And CNN founder Ted Turner revealed in 2018 he has Lewy body. Dr. John Doherty has walked thousands of families through the devastation of a dementia diagnosis, but there was no way to prepare for his own, even as a son who diagnosed his mother with Alzheimer's disease. His sister had it, too. It's hard to watch him be sad about those losses. Here's a man who used to control everything. I cried. I mean, that, that was tough. I remember going to work the next day and, 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 and struggling a little bit because he's this mentor for me for everything. This person who and I walk down the streets in Knoxville, people come up to me and say, you know, how just amazing he is. And he's asking me, you know, what is the meaning of time? Why, why is three o'clock in the morning different than six o'clock in the morning? I, I can't tell time. Revered for his deep connection to his patients and their families, John Doherty worked tirelessly to remove the stigma that often accompanied a diagnosis. So this is a photograph. He of continues to do that now by sharing his own diagnosis and journey. It's not just loss. We still have meaning. We can still do help people. And that's what John and I have done our whole life. We're both in the helping profession. So this is not exactly the way I imagined I'd be helping people. But it is what it is. And if we can keep that meaning, it, it inspires us. I think the main thing is to be in the moment. And that acceptance, the first noble truth is there is pain. There is pain, there will be pain, but you don't have to suffer. And if you resist the pain, that's suffering. First you cry, and you honor that. I mean, I have losses every day, I'm getting old. John and I make a better team. His past memory is better than mine, and my reason is better than his, so we're a pretty good team right now. Every year he was getting into car accidents and um, he was just forgetting a lot. Deborah and Wayne Wynn are at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta for answers after a very difficult year. I didn't know what day of the week it was. That's one of the problems I had. And then I didn't know uh, what month it was. I don't, I don't know what month it is right now. A mechanical engineer for 30 years, Wayne and Deborah were referred to Georgia MemoryNet by their primary care physician. Hey, Wayne, how are you? I'm great. I'm John Morgan. Nice to meet you. This never existed before. In a state where many counties lack a single neurologist and have few family doctors, early dementia diagnosis and care is next to impossible. You did a one-pager called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, looking at your uh, function on that and uh, it looked like you had some trouble uh, on that test. It was a little difficult for you. That goal of bringing memory assessments to Georgians who need them 
finally became real. It was passed by Georgia's legislature in 2018 and funded by the Georgia Department of Human Services and Division of Aging Services and is supported by community organizations like the Alzheimer's Association. There's a lot of education and training. Dr. James Law, Vice Chair of Emory Neurology, is the director of Georgia MemoryNet. Emory serves as the central coordinating and training center for the entire network across the state. I would love for everybody in the state of Georgia to be able to reach a center of expertise um, within the state in less than 60 minutes, um, uh, less than one hour of driving. With that distance in mind, Georgia MemoryNet was created. Five memory assessment clinics throughout the state, Augusta, Columbus, Macon, Albany, and downtown Atlanta. Navigation was also more difficult too, getting from point A to point B. Patients are referred by their primary care physicians. Well, let's go over your MRI results together, okay? There's some atrophy in the parietal lobe as well uh, of the brain. So you do have some shrinking of your brain in various spots. Do exactly what I do, okay? Neurologist Dr. John Morgan is the director of Georgia MemoryNet's Memory Assessment Center at the Medical College of Georgia. Like any kind of he tells the WINS that the results of some of the more detailed cognitive testing they did okay. raises right. concerns. The stuff in red here is the worrisome stuff, okay, where it's abnormal, it's below normal, okay? So your processing, processing speed was abnormal. Uh, one measure of, of the thinking executive function uh, speed was not good. Uh, and then your memory was significantly impaired, which is what I'm hearing in your history. Tap on big and fast like that. Good, okay, all right. He puts together a plan to recheck Wayne's thyroid levels and to treat him for depression, but he also prepares them for what the reality could be. There could very well be uh, an underlying process like Alzheimer's going on. At least it allows you to plan and to get treatment early. If you blow it off, you may be too late for a therapy that may have saved a lot of your memory. The WINS will be connected to resources and a social worker will help them plot a path forward. While many see a diagnosis of dementia as hopeless, there are interventions and promising drugs on the horizon that only work in early disease stages. I um, am starting to sort of really embrace the, uh, the idea and try and communicate the notion that diagnosis delayed is going to mean treatment denied uh, because these first rounds of really um, encouraging and effective Alzheimer's drugs will be meaningless if we don't identify these, uh, these people early enough. In a year complicated by COVID-19, Georgia MemoryNet is using telehealth in order to reach people who need assessments regardless of where they live in the state. Part of, um, of the long-term goal in my mind is to develop a system where statewide our citizens um, can have access to these uh, emerging treatments and really benefit. And then the downstream effect of that is going to be enormous because we're talking about drugs that potentially will take, you know, a, a disease that progresses over the course of 10 years. If we stretch that out to 15 years, it will reduce the cost and burden of Alzheimer's disease by 50%. I'm just going to find edge pieces because I don't have to yeah, pay well, attention like to this. anything other than the shit. It'll have a black ear on it. Jackie and David Spearman tackled the sort of insanely detailed puzzles that demand nothing less than a divine level of patience and persistence. Oh, wait. Look, there it is. Ah. <laughs> 77 years old, their life and retirement is filled with friends, family, volunteer work, and this. I've always been a real supporter of research. No kisses. To me, it doesn't, it's not painfully loud. And the lights are not nearly as bright as you would think they are. They start out bright. But then either your eyes adjust or something. And so they're not, they're bright, but they're not, I don't find them to be annoying. Okay. A retired psychotherapist, Jackie is part of a first ever human trial called Flicker. Except these have to go on first. As the name suggests, Jackie wears these glasses that flicker light 40 hertz 
40 times per second, along with a headset that turns a tone on and off 40 times per second. She's been doing this an hour a day for almost a year. I suspected something before anybody else did. Jackie was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, often a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. I was having a hard time with names, but I've always had a little bit of trouble with names. And all of my friends that are my age, you know, I'd say something and they'd say, oh, me too. I know, oh, we all do that. No, that's just normal. It's age. It's just aging. And so everybody would argue with me. So I have to ask you some questions. Okay. Jackie qualified to be one of 10 people in the world in the study. It's not Emory Brain Health's Dr. James Law is the lead investigator in the study. Flickr is um, our first attempt to try and see if we can translate a very promising uh, potential treatment strategy, a completely novel one, uh, that has shown great promise in uh, preclinical or animal models of Alzheimer's disease. Georgia Tech and Emory professor and research scientist Dr. Annabelle Singer was part of a team at MIT that created what came to be called Flickr. Like these flashing lights, our very brains flicker. These brain waves, or rhythms in the brain, happen when neurons oscillate on and off together. The connections, or talkings, between neurons is important for our memories to work like they should. When we are recalling a memory, it's known as replay. Replay is the same patterns of activity that you see during an experience get replayed. Literally like, you know, football replay when you're watching sports. And we think that that is important for memory because it helps bring back those experiences for your brain to uh, strengthen connections between cells, kind of like the same way you strengthen a muscle, you know, getting that, your brain to practice that activity over and over again. But when amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary or tau tangles build up in the brain, it's thought they can disrupt this important rhythm, hurting communication between neurons. We saw fewer of these replay events, and we also saw a lack of what we call gamma oscillations. These are uh, oscillations around 30 to 50 hertz that people have studied in many different brain regions. In uh, the hippocampus, which is important for memory, during this replay, we think it's important for coordinating many neurons to fire together, to behave together. So that deficit inspired us to stimulate at gamma to uh, potentially alter the course of the disease. This is a mouse undergoing flicker. Singer and the team discovered that when they flash lights at mice with Alzheimer's disease at 40 hertz, 40 times per second, similar to the brain's waves, the amount of amyloid plaques in the brain dropped dramatically. To make the clearing out even more effective, they added a clicking sound also at 40 hertz. When the mice were put through cognitive test, they performed dramatically better, such as remembering an object they'd seen before or where to find a platform in a pool. The lights did something else that was remarkable. In addition to getting groups of neurons to respond to the stimulation, they also activated the brain's immune cells called microglia. Microglia are like trash men, except the trash they are taking out is amyloid. As the only immune cells native to the brain, microglia may play a critical role in determining the course of Alzheimer's disease. There's been evidence for many, many years that microglia under certain um, activation states will gobble up the amyloid that's accumulated inside the brain. Now what we don't know is, um, you know, in terms of um, what the duration of the effect is. It takes a lot of discipline. Having flicker be effective in mice is one thing. Having it work in humans is another. It's not obvious, actually, that you should do the exact same thing in mice and humans. And humans are much more complicated. So first, I'm going to listen to your heartbeat. To measure if it's working, Jackie and the others undergo MRIs and PET scans and spinal taps and EEGs and blood draws. In all of our brains, amyloid and tau are constantly being made and constantly being cleared. One thing that could be going wrong in Alzheimer's is that they're being produced too much. Another thing that is could be that they're being cleared too slowly. That's why flicker is not a one-time thing. The results in mice showed that. If you do the stimulus just for an hour and look in sensory brain regions, the effects last for a couple hours. So the reduction in amyloid beta, for example, lasts for four to eight hours. By 24 hours, it's back 
uh, to normal. Amyloid builds up in the brain 20 or more years before symptoms begin. We're starting to see some evidence that in patients who have mild cognitive impairment from Alzheimer's disease, even though those people also have had this amyloid for many, many years, um, if we catch them at that very early mild cognitive impairment stage, doing things that remove the amyloid may yet benefit those individuals. We think it would be uh, something that you do every day potentially. And it might be something that you even start long before Alzheimer's. So maybe you start, like you brush your teeth, you know, starting when you're a little kid. You might start this when you're in middle age, long before you're worried about cognitive decline. <sighs> Lola and Paco keep Jackie company for her daily flicker session. I don't know if the flicker is doing anything or not, but it's not, it wouldn't cure me this fast anyway. Uh, I don't think it is a cure. I don't think they're looking for it, a cure. I think that maybe it's slowing it down. Results from this first human trial will come later this year. If it's successful, bigger studies will follow. You can watch Mrs. Maisel. Okay, turn it on. In the meantime, Jackie holds tight to hope, <laughs> to laughter, and to life with her best friend of more than half a century. But it also gave me hope that even if it doesn't, come to fruition in time to help me, maybe it will to help some people that are on down the line. All right, now that we're all here, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna take us over to the warm-up area while still walking in place. It's a very full day. Is we're gonna split the group in half. From guided exercise to group sessions. It's been difficult talking with other groups that are not diagnosed. To just hanging out. <laughs> but what you're looking at is a living laboratory. That's when I'm one that will teach researchers much more about dementing disorders in their earliest stages. I get so full and so excited to say, I'm part of a trailblazing team that's gonna be the benchmark for something that's gonna happen all over the world. Now, were you here today? And I said, you guys need to make a big old picture of us and put it on the wall out there, you know? Put our names beside because we are the first group. We know there are probably close to 50 million people in the United States today who have Alzheimer's disease pathology but are asymptomatic. It, you know, this is a chronic disease where it takes decades for the pathology to develop to the point where it overcomes an individual's resilience. We're starting this program as a research phase for people with mild cognitive impairment, memory loss. Patients are usually diagnosed and don't see their doctor again for a full year. This changes that and allows researchers to follow people week to week to see the progression, to learn what interventions are truly effective. The Cognitive Empowerment Program at Emory Brain Health is for those impacted and their care partners. For one year, twice a week, the group meets. Sensors and cameras will measure the gait and movements of participants, able to track changes for the better or worse throughout the year. So it is an observational research study, meaning that as we carry out our program, we're observing how people perform, um, both by doing baseline assessments. So we do some basic paper and pencil cognitive tests and some questionnaires based on their sense of well-being and their empowerment and their stress and depression. Um, and then we will monitor that over time. We're gonna explore what does that look like for you guys. It's not a one-way relationship between researchers and participants. Our real goal here is to help empower people to live the best best lives that they can for as long as they can. People with mild cognitive impairment and their care partners. Research is showing that certain interventions can slow progression of the disease. There is preliminary research that shows that structured activities like this help slow down progression, but we want to bolster that field of knowledge. We use cognitive brain training exercises on a computer program. You ready to start? That they can practice here, but also they can practice at home. So, Where was the one that was different? There, there you go. And then later we'll use some of our other developed cognitive um, programs that we've used in cognitive 
neurology for a long time that use calendars um, to train people to use a, a little handheld calendar that they keep with them all the time, um, to teach them strategies for reminders and compensatory strategies. Make sure you're breathing. We're still getting that blood flowing through the muscles. They're encouraged to exercise and embrace a Mediterranean diet. Welcome again to the Innovation Accelerator space. They are also partners with researchers from institutions like Georgia Tech and Emory. Some weeks it'll be students coming in and asking questions and talking with you. Some weeks it will be researchers coming in and having you do things like asking you to play games and answer questions and do focus groups. This group is filled with experts who can tell researchers what it feels like to live with a disease that slowly takes away from you and what it feels like to be the person caring for them. For me personally, uh, I just want to make to make sure that I can be the very best caregiver I can give because he is so awesome. And I don't want to get impatient and I don't want to get discouraged and I, I want to make sure that there, that there are resources that can help me be the best I can be. Together, these couples learn strategies to help them confront a diagnosis and a life that doesn't look the way they thought it would. All the while, researchers are accruing data, learning what strategies work. How to talk to others about MCI. As we gather that information, and we're also gathering data on their physical activity and their participation in the program, uh, researchers will be able to use that information to better inform whether or not these lifestyle interventions are making a difference, whether or not it's slowing down the progression of their disease, whether or not they're feeling more empowered and engaged and their sense of well-being is improving, or even hoping to see if it improves their mood. <laughs> this first of its kind program will hopefully be replicated across the country. The need is critical. We were involved in other clinical research uh, studies and to know that there's research with this and that maybe we're helping to contribute a little bit towards that. Um, I don't think it might, it might not help us that much, but maybe future people that are facing the diagnosis. I'm not here to cure my Alzheimer's. I mean, that would be nice if they stumbled onto that while they're here, but they, uh, the clock's ticking on them because I'm 70, what, five? Eight. eight 78, five, eight, whatever. The program continues virtually during the pandemic. Participants have called it a lifeline in this unusual year. Sixteen million adults in the United States are a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's disease or another dementing illness. And while the majority of those caregivers are women, in married couples over 75 years old, the care is equal between husbands and wives. We hope our final piece this week touches you as much as it touched us. It's about art and music and love. This is Phyllis and Richard's story. Even though it's free and open to the public, a seat at the Emory Chamber Music Society's midday concert is a hot ticket. Happy Valentine's Day, Phyllis. Phyllis. Dr. Richard Franco and his wife, Phyllis, are regulars at William Ransom's concerts. Music is a big part of their life. Richard takes Phyllis with him everywhere. Phil, we've got a great day to take a ride around. Not just to concerts. You're good. But to parks. Perfect in every way. All over Atlanta. Every little breeze seems to whisper. First of all, I don't want to be lonely. Secondly, I'm proud to show Phyllis off anywhere we go, right? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Uh, thirdly, uh, why wouldn't we go out? We're, we're just together. All righty, here we go, Phil. Phyllis had a phenomenal memory. I always relied on her when we went to a party. She knew the names of everyone. I didn't. Phyllis loves to go out and about. A neurologist for 42 years, Dr. Richard Franco recognized the devastating symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in his wife more than a dozen years ago. Everything is pretty. pretty. The sun is out. He left his practice after Phyllis drove almost to Alabama on the wrong side of the road. On your mark, let's go up. Both 82 years old, Richard takes care of Phyllis full time. You have 
someone come at night yes. so you can sleep. Right. But you are her caregiver every day. Well, I don't really look at myself as the caregiver. I look at myself as we're partners in functioning together. It may be hot. Let me try it. You ready to dig in? So from the time she wakes up and throughout the day. Here we go. Ready? Upsy daisy. He tends to the woman he fell in love with in 10th grade civics class. Walking, walking, walking. I couldn't get a date with her because people would ask her six months in advance. We forgot to say a blessing. These days, Amotzi lechem min haaretz, amen. Their life together has a soundtrack. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Music is in a different part of the brain when the skies are gray. Than memory. Most of memory is in the temporal lobes, hippocampal area. Music is often spared. It's one of the great means of connecting and communicating. Please don't take my sunshine away. Music became more important as Phyllis suffered losses, like speaking and walking and playing piano and painting. Art was her inner self coming out into the expressing itself in the world. A highly regarded artist, their home is filled with her massive works of art. It's all very impressionistic of the river, the sun. It's not a portrait, it's full of action. I wish Phyllis was telling you about her art because uh, you know, I'm sad that that she can't do it, but it speaks for her. Let me turn on a light in here. Phyllis's art changed as her disease progressed, becoming more surreal. There she is in a door that's part open, and then there's this long hallway, and she was entering some new phase of life and going down a long hallway to a different place. Mom, you know Cheery Bum? Cheery Bim? The moment Dad would walk in the door, everything would be for Dad. And he would come in in this great mood. The Franco's three children have been marinated in their parents' love affair their entire lives. Hey! <laughs> I just remember you guys just having a lot of fun together, dancing in the kitchen. They watched their father adapt to each change, each loss in their mother. On a pre-COVID visit, their oldest son, Lewis, and his family, along with daughters Rebecca and Meryl. Any song we start. Do what they've always done, make music together. I'll be seeing you. Richard has diagnosed thousands of people with dementing disorders. Many were strangers, some were dear friends and family. In a disease marked by endless losses, where treasured memories vanish, Richard focuses on what remains, and that is the woman he loves most in the world. But I'll be seeing you. There's still a whole person there. Phyllis remained Phyllis. She didn't disappear on me. Hey. <laughs> is Phyllis still Phyllis? She sure is. She's not the same Phyllis, but she's very much Phyllis. Phyllis's gift for playing piano has been passed down to her granddaughter, who plays one of her favorites, Claire de Lune. That spark, that love of creating music still lives within her. Richard now sees all those decades of his neurology career as part of his destiny. I feel that my, really my whole life was preparing me for this. This is, this is what 
I was supposed to be doing at this point in my life. I've got this wellspring of experience and feeling and attachment and love. And it is, I don't know if love conquers everything, but it can conquer a lot of, of what the tragic parts are. We've been very blessed, very fortunate to find each other in the first place. That's the biggest thing, right? Every time I drive my truck by that spot when I think of my luck. I'm grateful for what we have now. I like being around Phyllis. For that brazen crow and that stupid squirrel. You, 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 and me. you and me, right? We're sticking together through all kinds of weather. All right, here we go, Phil. So we'll travel the road, carry the load, side by side. <laughs> Despite the COVID-19 global pandemic, research is continuing, and it's estimated that in just a couple years, we'll have a blood test that can accurately predict Alzheimer's disease, leading to crucial early interventions and treatments, preserving memories for families like the Francos and millions of others around the world. That's gonna do it for us this week. See you next time on Your Fantastic Mind. Support for your fantastic mind, provided by Southern Company Foundation.